My name is Sarah Penniston Dorland. I'm from the University of Maryland, and I'm pleased to be able to moderate the next session, which is a second golden age for metamorphic petrology. The session was proposed by a graduate student named Carl Hoyland, who's at Stanford University. Um, and Carl had the perspective to recognize that metamorphic petrology experienced a, a golden age, I guess he's giving it the first golden age, um, with the advent of the electron microprobe and the use of equilibrium thermodynamics to understand pressure and temperature conditions and apply those to crustal problems and understanding how the Earth behaves. He also has um, the perspective to understand that we are perhaps now entering a second golden age of metamorphic petrology with our ability to measure things on ever smaller scales and to measure very small concentrations, um, uh, abilities that we haven't had previously, um, and to use processes um, other than equilibrium. So thinking about processes such as disequilibrium processes, thinking about chemical disequilibrium, but also recently, recent developments in metamorphic petrology are allowing us to understand or to use and interpret mechanical responses of minerals um, and rocks in order to try to, again, make sense of crustal processes and the earth. So our two speakers today are designed to shed some light on some of those new directions that metamorphic petrology is taking um, to get us to think about these ideas, to think about the future of metamorphic petrology. Um, so our two speakers are Ross Angel, who's going to be talking about physics and thermobarometry. Um, he's from the University of Pavia. Um, and then also Lucy Teichmanova, who is from Heidelberg University, who's talking about um, exploring the future of metamorphic geology. Um, normally, I would start a talk like this by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak. Um, but in some sense, um, I'm a bit out of place. This title of this talk was, as Shakespeare would have said, thrust upon me. It's not my choice. And those of you who know me and the people who taught me know that I'm certainly not a physicist. I think I failed my first year physics exam in Cambridge. And Tim Holland has been telling me for 40 years, I'm certainly not a petrologist. <laughs> Nonetheless, I'm fortunate enough to be working for the last two years with a very talented young man, Matteo Alvaro, who's talented at managing research, big ideas, and getting large amounts of money from the European community and other sources. And that has enabled him to build up quite a large group of very young, mostly young, uh, scientists who have a uh, range from uh, very talented physicists through to uh, people who are very good in the field and people who are very good at both things. And what I'm going to talk about today is new methods that uh, these guys have developed, new results um, that hopefully will uh, promote uh, some new understanding into uh, more subtleties in petrology and understanding how the earth works. Okay, so um, how do I summarize this first golden age of metamorphic petrology? Well, basically, I've tried to do this in one diagram. This is a garnet from a high-pressure rock. You can see it's zoned. And traditional metamorphic petrology has been developed with phase, a knowledge of phase equilibrium and so on under the assumptions of uniform pressure and temperature. We interpret the chemistry of this garnet and the changing chemistry in terms of a path in PT space. And during the production of the garnet, the garnet forming reactions produce excess silica. Uh, the silica gets trapped first of, as quartz, and then as the uh, rock reaches uh, peak conditions, it starts trapping coesite instead. And this all makes, seems to make sense in terms of equilib thermodynamic equilibrium Gibbs free energy. But this slide also illustrates a couple of problems. Three, actually. Why have we still got quartz? Why didn't the quartz transform to coesite when this rock got into the coesite stability field? Why do we still find coesite of room conditions? It should be quartz. It's not the stable phase. And then the key to this talk, for example, is the answer to these questions. Why do the quartz inclusions in the core of these garnets now exhibit excess pressures when the garnet is sitting in our thin section at room pressure and temperature. The answer, of course, to all of these questions is confinement. 
the inclusions are confined by the garnet. Okay? And as a consequence of this, there are stress gradients built up around the inclusions. So we're looking at a rock with stress gradients in it. The quartz in our garnet is at high pressure. The garnet in our hand is at room pressure. So we have pressure gradients. And so we have a problem if we're applying Gibbs equilibrium principles. Okay. That's been known for a long time. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, someone's stolen my pointer. Okay. If you go and look at any of these rocks in thin section, we're in garnets, so they're cubic. If you look at them between cross polars, you see birefringent halos. You see the same thing in inclusions trapped inside diamonds. So we've broken the symmetry of the garnets, and we've developed because of the stress pushing out of the inclusions onto the host mineral. Um, that's been known a long time. Um, the, digging around in the literature 50 years ago, 40 years ago, basically when I started studying science, um, these guys wrote the paper, analysis of residual stresses at the scale of mineral grains, like this, within a polycrystalline aggregate, such as a rock, is virtually intractable. That was 1979. It wasn't true back then. The phenomena to interpret these observations was available from some much older physics. First of all, the optical birefringence is caused by uh, strain-induced birefringence, so you're straining the garnet. That's described by the PHO optic tensor. That was recognized in diamonds by at least this person in 1955, modern application uh, more recently. What's more, if you go around and map the Raman shifts in here, in the garnet, you find they move around, the Raman bands move around because of the effects of the strain, and that's described by the phonon mode gruneisen tensor, which dates back actually to earlier than this, somewhere around about 1913, when the fundamentals of solid state physics were developed. Uh, and there's a more modern reference to actually apply these things. And the third thing is, if you go around, I'll show you in the next slide, a map the Raman intensities in this strained area of the gar garnet, uh, you can see the intensities change. That's due to the pH of phonon tensor properties. That was recognized around the time of these guys writing, saying measuring these strains and stresses is impossible. And here's an example where we've actually applied these ideas. Okay, so let's just take that third guy as, a, as an example. When you go in with your Raman spectrometer and do point, collect the spectra from these four points, you can see the intensity in polarized spectra changes. This HH polarization peak drops a little bit as we move, um, move in towards the inclusion, which is straining the, the garnet, and the VH polarization peak goes up. There's a, trans, there's a depolarization. Okay? You can use the intensity to map the strain field. How do inclusions interact? Simple. Go round, HH polarization, measure the intensity of this mode, bum, 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 bum. here's a zircon, here's another zircon in a garnet. And you can see the strain fields. And you can see the interaction of these two inclusion strain fields. So we can map things at the micron scale. Okay? Not nano, but strain doesn't exist at the nano scale. It's, it's a thermodynamic concept. Okay? Okay. To determine the stresses in here, we need to know what the physical property tensors are. We don't have them at the moment. Okay? That's something we can do in the computer. So confinement in general, that's just one example, creates stress gradients. I've talked about host inclusion systems where one mineral is trapped inside another. And there's, for example, in quartz, the quartz mineral wants to expand more than the garnet host will allow it. And it builds up stress. And that stress then propagates into the host. One thing that I think everybody has looked at perthites in alkali feldspars. These are not perthites, these are diffusion experiments. But when you have coherency of the crystal lattice across a larger crystal and compositional gradients, the same in the garnet that I've already shown, you build up GPA level stresses. Minerals in general, whether if they have compositional gradients or one mineral against another, constraints provide, uh, produce stress gradients across the system. No rock is under uniform pressure or stress. 
At the larger scale, it's been suggested that constriction in subduction zones, uh, there's a reference here, if you constrict subduction, you could generate up to 3 GPA pressure, not at 90 kilometers, where depth equals pressure, but maybe only at 50 kilometers. So when we see kerizite that indicates 3 GPA, does it mean the rock went down to 90 kilometers or maybe only 50 kilometers and was compressed? You can do the same thing in the lab, in a, in, uh, in a Griggs rig or whatever. Okay? Produce kerizite outside its official stability field. Okay. So, some big questions for geology which I think need to be answered. On what scale? So, how big are the deviations from lithostatic pressure? Which one of these pictures is true? On what scales? On the grain scale, pressure, stress varies from grain to grain across the grain. But does it also vary like this? Do we have significant tectonic stresses? If we do, then pressure is no longer an indication of depth. The pressure we infer from thermodynamic equilibrium. How deep is continental crust subducted before exhumation? What are the consequences for thermodynamics and our interpretation of the mineral apparent equilibrium? And can we use these ideas to measure the paleo stress in the crust or in subduction zones at the time of metamorphism? Those are some challenges for the fundamentals of geology. Okay. To understand this, let's go back to our simplest model, isotropic inclusion. So think quartz inside a garnet Quartz and garnet are not isotropic, but let's think of them as so. When they traps the inclusion, they have the same pressure and temperature, and the inclusion fits in the hole in the garnet. No void space under 2, 3 GPA. Okay? Now do a thought experiment. Don't bring them up to the surface together. Just bring the garnet up. The hole in the garnet expands with the properties of the garnet. The quartz, on the other hand, expands. If we could take it out and bring it up to the surface, will expand more. It's softer. It's four times softer. Okay? So to get that quartz back into the hole in the garnet, we have to apply stress. And therefore, the inclusion in the garnet is under pressure. We can measure that. If we measure it, and we know the equations of state, how the volumes of these minerals change with pressure and temperature, we can back calculate the, the uh, conditions under which the uh, pressure and temperature and volume were equal for the two phases, and we've got another geobarometer. That's what's been developed in the past few years. Let's say last decade by the uh, petrology community. So does it work? Well, the problem is, is testing it out on real rocks. We don't know what the experiment was. We don't know the pressure and temperature. So if you go to the piston cylinder, we synthesize some garnets. Okay, this was done in, by one of our students, but with uh, Jay Thomas, who's somewhere in the audience. Okay, synthesize quartz in almondine garnets, measure the Raman spectra, calculating the inclusion pressures using how we know the Raman bands shift with pressure which is shown here on the left. And what you see on the right here is, for one of the experiments, this is the pressure calculated from one of these lines, pressure calculated from the hydrostatic shift of another line. And what you see is the blue guys from one experiment fall more or less on the line. The higher pressure synthesis don't. The pressures indicated by different Raman bands are different. What a surprise. It's because we don't have isotropic materials. So if you think of our thought experiment again, our quartz doesn't come up as a sphere, it comes up as an egg. And to get an egg back into a spherical hole, you have to push differently in different directions. We will have an increase in stress, right? but it won't be equal in all directions. So an anisotropic inclusion trapped inside a cubic mineral will develop anisotropic stress. Some basic physics. Now, we've known for 50 years and more that the Raman lines of quartz shift differently with anisotropic stress. Here's the hydrostatic calibration of one particular line. Here's what happens if you put a large weight on top of the x-axis of quartz. 
gem quality crystal, put a weight on it, and here's on the C axis. The slopes are different. Okay? And now we have to go back even further to understand this to some basic physics from the, from the birth of solid state physics. And that means Grunaisen in, okay, the textbook was 1926, but the original papers were published 1910 to 1913. He made the point that frequencies of phonon modes, that's what we're measuring the vibrations in the crystal. Phonon modes are the collective vibrations, and we can measure some of them by Raman spectroscopy. Do not depend on stress or pressure. That's obvious, isn't it? Because when you heat a mineral, the Raman lines shift, but you're not changing the stress on the material. It's sitting on your spectrometer at room pressure. So the frequencies of vibrational modes actually depend on the strains applied to the unit cell. And here's a very nice example we published in Anmin. It's, it's showing the obvious. We are plotting the volume change here, which we know from the equation of state, against the Raman shift. These guys up here are high pressure, lots of experiments, including the anisotropic ones. Here's the high temperature measurements in expansion. They all form on a, fall on a single line. So the frequency of vibrational modes depend on the strains applied to the crystal, not primarily to the temperature and pressure. So, Gruneisen didn't really address this in super detail. He worked on isotropic materials, but he clearly understood, if you look at the papers, that this was an anisotropic problem. And in the 60s, the theory was developed. The Relationship between stresses and strains is given by this equation. We have a group mode Gruneisen tensor with coefficients that are properties. This is the mode shift, and these are the strains. So each one gives you how much does the mode move around for each individual strain. For uniaxial crystals like quartz, some of these numbers are zero by symmetry. Gamma 1 equals gamma 2. And for each mode, the mode shift is given by this equation. Back in the 60s, you couldn't determine that, those numbers. What we now have is powerful computers. We can do ab initio DFT simulations of crystal structures very accurately and reproduce the Raman spectra. And then we can do one further thing. We can strain the, the, the crystal in the computer by a con controlled amount, and we can calculate the Raman shifts as a function of the E1 and the E3 strains, the A and the C axis strains. These are two contour maps of the mode shifts. You can see they're different. Different modes have different shifts with stresses, different mode Gruneisen parameters. And more to the point, these lines are not parallel to a line of constant mean stress. That is what Gruneisen told us in 1920s. And that's why the hydrostatic calibration doesn't work. So do these numbers make sense? Well, you, the only thing we can do is that we know how the cell parameters of quartz change with pressure. We've calculated from computer simulations the gammas, so we can calculate, calculate using our uh, mode Gruneisen tensors, the lines are our predictions from computer simulations and the Gruneisen idea. The dots are experiments, not bad. You can do it for different materials. Here's zircon. We did exactly the same thing. So we can now you turn this around. We can use the Raman shifts to measure strains. That is the new idea. It's an old idea, but we can now do it. So the idea is we go to one of our experimental samples, we zap it with the laser, we measure the Raman shifts, and for instance, if we're looking at these two bands, maybe we get a number, a shift of this one, which is about plus four, this one's about plus 20, and where those two lines cross over, tells us what the strain is. So we can measure the strain in an inclusion. And from the strain, we can calculate the stresses because we have the elastic properties. Okay? If you do this on this experimental sample, you can recover, and then do the equation of state calculation, recover the known entrapment conditions. So it works. If you do this full analysis of the anisotropic strain, you get the correct value even at this 3 GPA experiment. But if you assume that quartz is isotropic and the pressure is hydrostatic, you get completely the wrong numbers. Okay? But that makes sense. The physics makes sense. Okay. So in the last couple of minutes, before Sarah drags me screaming from the stage, <laughs> let me introduce another idea from 50 years ago. Anisotropic thermal pressure. 
And it sounds a bit obscure, but it's going to be fundamental for using in equations of state. You all know what an isochore is. That's the black lines. It's a line in PT space along which the volume of the crystal doesn't change. You can also calculate a line in PT space along which the A axis of the crystal doesn't change. And the C axis, these are all uniaxial crystals. For quartz, you see all three lines are basically the same, which means when we travel along an isochore, the self-parameters don't change. That is not true in rutile and zircon, because the C axis is much stiffer, but has a much larger thermal expansion coefficient. Okay. That means if we have strains along the ice core, I've just told you, that means we have uh, mode shifts along the ice core, and that has two important consequences. First, the mode shifts with temperature can be predicted, not this soft mode, by the mode Grunison approach when you have isotopic thermal pressure, but not when it's anisotropic. In zircon, we get it completely wrong. But more importantly, for all the thermodynamic databases that you use, Thermocalc, Perplex, all use what are known as quasi-harmonic approximation equations of state. They're based on the assumption that mode frequencies that give you the thermal pressure, the vibrations that generate the thermal pressure, the pressure increase in a mineral when you heat it up, are wrong. And here's an example. We know what the param other parameters are. For This is for Rutile. We've just got enough data for this. And over here, if we use the quasi-harmonic equation of state, we can fit the thermal expansion, we can fit the elasticity at high pressure, but the variation in bulk modulus with temperature is completely wrong. So anisotropy gives you opportunities. Oh, sorry, problems. It also gives you an, uh, um, uh, opportunities because if we can solve these problems and measure the strains in different directions, I've only been talking about volume, which gives us one number. We can't determine the pressure and temperature entrapment from one measurement. If we can measure how these different directions in the crystal change with, different, uh, with pressure and temperature, we can not only uniquely define entrapment conditions, but also measure the deviatoric stress at the time of uh, metamorphism. It's a long way, maybe another decade to do that. Let me just wrap up as a way of introducing the next speaker. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> this is where we are at the moment, I think. First age of metamorphology, we tend to think of chemistry on one side. Mechanics is something to do with structural geology. We introduce time. So we have reaction kinetics and plastic or viscous flow. Sorry. Um, where, where can we go in the future? put all of these together. The coupling of mechanics and chemistry, what's the effect of stress on thermodynamics, what's the effect of stress on kinetics, and if we can do that, we can start answering the big questions in geology. I'm not a pathologist, I said at the beginning, right? This is a problem for pathology, so I'll now hand you over to a real pathologist, Lucy. Thank you.